the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, presents The Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. When there's beer on your mind, your best thought is Schlitz, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. More people like the taste of Schlitz than any other beer. That's why Schlitz is the largest selling beer in America. And now, the Halls of Ivy. Welcome again to Ivy, Ivy College, that is, in the town of Ivy, USA. To uh, judge by the heap of unfinished business on the desk of Dr. William Tarpenter Hall, president of Ivy, college is in going concern. Mrs. Hall, the former Victoria Cromwell of the London stage, tactfully interrupts him at his desk, which is buried under an enormous pile of miscellaneous papers. Haven't you gone yet, Toddy? Your appointment at two. Yes, I know, Vicky. But at the moment, I'm not sure whether I'm on the edge of order or the brink of chaos. Give me another hour and you won't recognize this desk. Well, how could I recognize it? I've never seen it. You've never unveiled it. <laughs> it's one of the grosser untruths that a man's mind is necessarily as cluttered as his desk. Tidy thinking leaves little time to deal with the enormous accumulations in any busy man's normal day. And besides, you never know what interesting tidbits may emerge from the debris. Look, look at this memo I discovered under the blotter. Five on Prince B in the third. <laughs> well, Toddy, you're a secret gambler. How fascinating. And, and how did Prince D do in the third? That's what puzzles me. I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> I'm not much of a gambling man, as you know. I don't remember a thing about this memo. Whose handwriting is it, may I ask? Mine, indubitably mine. That is what is so baffling. Where did I get the tip? Did I make the bet? And when was it? We well, you went to the races with me at Ascot in England, and you loved it, do you remember? <laughs> it was because I was with you that I loved it, my darling. Not because this sport of kings had aroused any fever in my blood. Besides, if college professors are seldom equipped financially to cope with the vagaries of the tote board. <laughs> Five on Prince B in the third. In the third, where? Well, there are ways and ways of getting clipped, dear, and one of them is in Doc Fish's barber chair and is getting very late for your appointment. Oh, yes, yes, and uh, I'll ask Doc if he ever heard of a horse named Prince D. He'll know. Yeah, and if he doesn't know, he'll invent the information complete with past performances, jockey changes, and the condition of the track. So, <laughs> on your way, horse player. <laughs> Now, as I see it, Dr. Hall, there's nothing wrong with your curriculum, except it's mostly a lot of stuff that nobody will ever use. How much you went off the top? <laughs> the usual. Just enough to make it appear that it hasn't been cut. I guess you didn't know what you were letting yourself in for when you hired this new English professor of yours, this Huntley fellow. What beats me is, what are they seeing in him? He's not even good looking. Professors are not, as a rule, judged by their masculine pulchritude. Ivy has never expected that any member of its faculty need qualify for Mr. America. Well, what goes on on the campus is your job, I suppose. I've been called a gossip just once too much, so from now on, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. But if I wanted to talk, I could tell you stuff about this Professor Huntley that would make your hair stand on end. <laughs> It might be easier to cut that way, but I'd prefer that you try it out on someone else. <laughs> all right, all right. I made up my mind not to say a word anyway. Never get any thanks for it. After all, if Huntley wants to make love to all the girls in town, that's none of my affair. <laughs> But if I were running this university, I don't know what I'd do. 
I envy you, Doc. You can run both your own job and mine, too. I only know my own. <laughs> Vicky, where are you? Yeah, darling. Uh, you have a visitor. Oh. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Wellman. Uh, sorry I kept you waiting. That's all right. I have other things to do, but this couldn't wait. It's critical, Dr. All is critical. Well, then, by all means, let's hear about it at once. Well, I'll be brief. Do you know about Professor Huntley? I know that you and I both had haircuts today. <laughs> well, what, what's that? Uh, haircuts? Well, what's that got to do with that? I mean, who told you? Well, no one told me. But I don't know whether you told Doc Fish or he told you what you're going to tell me about Professor Huntley. <laughs> this is a serious matter, Dr. Hall. One to be avoided at any cost. At any cost. Ivy is threatened by a real scandal. Are you sure you don't mean scandal, Munger? I mean scandal. I know what I mean. Sure. I mean that Professor Huntley has been going out. With a girl. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Wellman, but just as a layman on such things, do they hang men in this country for that? Uh, in England, fraternizing between the sexes has been approved for some time. <laughs> this is a very young girl, Mrs. Hall, a freshman. It will develop, or has already, into a nasty scandal. And worse, possibly. Oh, yes. Her name is uh, Linda Matthews, freshman. You must be quite convinced that all this is true. Naturally, you wouldn't be so concerned if you'd heard, only heard a rumor. I'll ignore that, Dr. Hall. I am not a complete idiot. That is... Uh, Vicky. <laughs> uh, and, of course, uh, Mr. Wellman, you would present proof of the allegation at the proper time? I would suggest that you direct your investigation to the people involved. It's your responsibility to keep the good name of Ivy above reproach. I've been merely trying to save you from any embarrassment that would result from your innocence or, 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 or ignorance about what is common knowledge. Good day, Dr. Hall, uh, Mrs. Hall. I'll see you to the door. Don't bother. I know my way out. <laughs> his way out, he also knows his way in. Uh, you know, that was a very modest statement he made, that he was not a complete idiot. I thought the job had been finished for some time. <laughs> As chairman of the Board of Governors, Mr. Wellman is a delicate tuning fork for wind-borne crises. To me, there is no more doleful sound than the hollow reverberation of an idea striking a brass hat. <laughs> is, is this talk about Professor Huntley Doc Fish is doing? Well, he intimated darkly that Huntley was a danger to Ivy womanhood and was about to lose a flood of scandal when I stopped him. I could discount Fish for the manga he is, but Wellman... As public defender, uh, unappointed, of course, even Wellman wouldn't pick on a freshman just to take a smack at you, dear. Well, darling, I'm responsible for Huntley. I recommended him for the English department. Wellman opposed it. Poor Huntley will be the scapegoat, just because he happens to be popular with the students. Darling, didn't any of your students ever have a crush on you? Uh, that question is irrelevant, immaterial, and... <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> if I'd been in your class, I'd have fallen in love with you. You were uh, uh, naturally, darling, yes. But I'm not Professor Huntley, and you're not Linda Matthews. And I must find a solution for this business. It'll save both their faces and confound Mr. Wellman. That's what I say. Confound Mr. Wellman. <laughs> In, Professor Huntley. Uh, Dr. Hall will be down in a minute. Thanks, Mrs. Hall. I've been wanting to talk to you ever since the registration ball. Oh, really? Yes, I tried my best to cut in for a dance, but the, uh, the competition was too keen. <laughs> Especially from Dr. Hall. He practically made a monopoly. Well, he called it a holding company, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. Next time, I'll have more courage and petition a stockholders' protest meeting. <laughs> oh, hello, Dr. Hall. Oh, Professor Huntley, it's nice to see you. And thank you for coming over. Always glad to see you, Doctor. You, uh, you wanted to talk to me? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Down, won't you? Thank you. Uh, Professor, I've never gone along with the theory that a teacher's ability can be measured by his unpopularity, or with Cowper that a teacher should be sparing of his smile. I see no harm in any member of the faculty being on the most pleasant terms with his students. 
And now that I've made that unnecessary little speech, I'll, I'll come to the point. Have you heard the rumor that you were in love with a girl, a freshman here at Ivy? What? Or vice versa? Oh, you're kidding. Both of you. Aren't you? No, no, we're not. I just thought you should know that a couple of energetic gossip mongers are, are tossing your reputation about rather vigorously. And who is supposed to be the object of my sinister affection? The rumor so far limits itself to your, I think they call it going out with, a student by the name of Linda Matthews. Linda Matthews. Oh, poor Linda. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dr. Gore, but I, I can't believe this. Do you mean that somebody seriously thinks that... <laughs> I, I, I'd never go so far as to imply that my informants in this matter have any great capacity for serious thinking. Look, uh, Doctor, Linda Matthews is one of the best students I have in English A. She's attentive, she's eager, and she has imagination. I'm very much interested in her. Why, I've even loaned her some of my books and given her a lift a couple of times in my car. But how could anybody make anything out of that? Ah, uh, the appetite for scandal grabs for the smallest muscle and can fatten on crumbs. But then you teach a course in fiction, Professor. You know how stories are developed. Yes. Does Linda know about this? Oh, I hope not for her sake. Then I have one favor to ask, Dr. Hall. Don't tell her unless it's necessary. She's a pretty sensitive girl. If there's anything I can do, anything as commonplace as kicking somebody around the campus, let me know. I will. <laughs> if I'm not able to disabuse certain minds myself. Well, thanks for coming over, Professor. Not at all. Bye, Doctor. Uh, good day. Uh, oh, oh. Um, uh, by the way. Yes? Um, ever play the horses, Huntley? No, no horses. Well, uh, that's not an official question, Professor. Just background information. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can be had for a little penny ante almost any evening, but... Otherwise, my gambling instinct seems a little stunted. Ah, then you wouldn't have heard of a horse named Prince D? No, I'm afraid not. Sorry, Doctor. Goodbye, Mrs. Hall. Goodbye. 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 <laughs> nice. It's very nice. I wouldn't blame Linda Matthews if she did have a small crush on him. I must say I admire his restraint under the circumstances. But, as I suspected, it's nothing more than a small breeze stirred up by a couple of old windbags. <laughs> <laughs> it seems that Mr. Wellman is not a tycoon. He's a typhoon. <laughs> it's a typographical error. <laughs> <laughs> Vicky, do you realize the basic difference between me and Mr. Wellman? Well, um, starting alphabetically... A, you are admirable and he's asinine. B, you are bright, he's balmy. C, uh, no, you are no, 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 no. Not a complete character analysis, darling. Uh, just the basic difference. Well, what do you think it is? I think it's just that I can't help liking people and Mr. Wellman can't like helping people. Oh, that's well poor thought. <laughs> uh, yes. But to go on, D, you are direct and he is devious. E, you are easy and he's exasperating. this Professor Huntley nonsense with you. No, he didn't discuss, Mr. Merriweather. He charged, like Teddy Roosevelt, going up San Juan Hill. <laughs> we're, we're happy to hear you classify it as nonsense. In due time, Mrs. Hall, usage will make Wellman synonymous with nonsense. <laughs> he says if you don't take punitive action right away, Doctor, he's going to call a board of governors meeting and throw the book at Huntley. <laughs> Mr. Wellman naturally wouldn't know of any other use for a book. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Doctor, this thing can really get pretty messy if we don't clear it up before Clarence makes it worse than it is. And he can. You know Clarence. 
He thinks Whistler's mother wears that white bonnet because she's smuggling opium in her hair net. <laughs> Did you just have your hair cut, Mr. Medweather? No, what's that? Oh, oh, you mean Doc Fair? Yeah, no, yeah. no. No, I didn't hear this from him. I got it straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, if you'll excuse that reference to Mrs. Merriweather. <laughs> you see, uh, Ruth told her, and Ruth's always been a pretty honest kid. But Ruth who? Uh, Ruth Marie Cheswick. She lives on our block. She's a freshman, friend of this Linda Matthews. I shut her up, but I think you ought to talk to her, Doctor. Uh, can you see her this afternoon? Oh, of course I'll see her. And thank you for telling me. Incidentally, Mr. Mayweather, uh, do you believe this story? As a member of the Board of Governors, Doctor, I view the matter with great trepidation. But as Charlie Merriweather, taxpayer and self-made oak, I think it's a lot of whale oil. Ah, <laughs> uh, Mr. Merriweather, gossip is a virus, and a virus is infectious. Even if you are immune, we must do what we can to stop an epidemic. <laughs> Yes, I did tell Mrs. Merriweather, Dr. Hall, but if I thought I'd be making any trouble for Linda, I'd never have opened my mouth. I like Linda. Of course, she's not exactly a close friend. Well, then perhaps you'll tell us why you think Professor Huntley has any more than an academic interest in her. Because I saw her get out of his car one afternoon, and then I know he gave her his own copy of Montaigne's essay. You mean to say you saw all that? Well, his name was right there on the flyleaf, Mrs. Hall. Miss Cheswick, I still don't understand why you spread this story. I didn't spread any story, Dr. Hall. Linda told me all this herself. Linda told you, of course. It's all she talks about. How wonderful he is, what a smooth dancer he is, and the swell places he's taken her. In the beginning, I thought she was just bragging. But Linda's an awfully smart girl, Dr. Hall. I guess she's the kind of a girl a professor would go for. Well, what about the college boys, Ruth? Do they feel the same way about her? Oh, no. I mean, I don't think so, Mrs. Hall. Linda's not very... Well, she's the quiet type. For a quiet type, she seems to have been quite garrulous. <laughs> I don't like to disenchant you, Miss Jessic, but Professor Huntley gave Linda Matthews his copy of Montaigne's essays for only one reason. He wanted her to read them. He gave her an automobile ride, perhaps a couple of them, for only one reason, to see that she got to school. Now, as prosaic as these facts are, they are facts, the only facts. Thank you for coming over, Miss Jessie. Oh, that's all right, Dr. Hall. I guess I'd better go now. I've got a lot of collateral reading to do. <laughs> Answer you to the door. Gee, Mrs. Hall, I hope Dr. Hall isn't mad at me. I hate to get the president sore at me right at the start. Four years is a long time. <laughs> don't worry, I don't think you'll stay mad that long. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye, Mrs. Hall. Toddy, I'm sorry for that girl, Linda Matthews. Yes, I am too. On the one hand, uh, Ruth makes her out to be a giddy adolescent, but according to Huntley, she's a budding intellectual. On the other hand, I can't let her get away with this. And yet, you, you never know what you might do to a girl. Do you like mind that. if I jump into this debate you're having with yourself, darling? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not at all. Pick a side. I never could understand about debating. It doesn't matter what you believe in. You just take sides. <laughs> anyway, this is not a question of sides. It's simply a matter of approach. In my official capacity, I must severely censure Linda Matthews, notwithstanding any personal sympathy I might have for her. Mm, and I have it too, and nobody's ever called me official. Do you, do you mind if I go and see her, Toddy? In my official capacity, I have no jurisdiction over your inclinations, Mrs. Hall, uh, and personally it will take a big load off my mind, uh, which will leave me with only one cruel mental burden. When did I bet five dollars on Prince D? <laughs> yes? 
Oh, the landlady said I could come up if you're not busy, Miss Matthews. May I come in for a moment? I'm Victoria Hall. Oh, yes, I recognized you, Mrs. Hall. Of course. Please come in. I'm sorry the place is such a mess, but I wasn't expecting company. Well, I didn't know your telephone number, and I wanted to see you. Me? Yes. Professor Huntley spoke so highly of you, I wondered why you hadn't entered into any of the freshman activities. Oh, well, I'm not very good at that sort of thing, and there's so much work to do. <laughs> That's a popular complaint. I, honestly, I don't know how any freshman ever gets to be a sophomore. <laughs> oh, I'm not complaining, Mrs. Hall. I love it here. Yes, I love it, too. Of course, when I first came in, I was scared to death. You? Mm -hmm. It's funny, too, because I'd opened up in so many new shows before new audiences, but this time I was I wasn't going to play a part. I, I was just going to be myself, and I wanted to be a hit. You know something, Linda? Audiences are much easier to please than people. <laughs> yes, I, I suppose so. And when you come from a big city like London, it's hard to believe that Professor X's wife is quoting publicly something you said privately to Professor Q's wife. <laughs> I know, Mrs. Hall, I come from a town even smaller than I do. Oh, then you know that anybody's business somehow becomes everybody's. Uh, Linda... I really came to see you because a couple of old busybodies are talking about you. What, what are they saying? Well, what they're saying isn't really important. It's what can happen to you and Professor Huntley. Has, has he heard about it? Yes, he has. Oh, oh Mrs. Hall, how can I... It isn't true. It isn't true. I, I'm sorry, Mrs. Hall. I, I know you didn't mean... I, I mean, I can't stay here. I've got a class. I've got to run. <laughs> Oh, dear. I tried to get her to talk, Toddy, but I just scared her off. I was a complete flop. Didn't she have anything at all to say? Oh, she didn't have to, darling. It, it was all there. The shabby boarding house, long way from the campus... The dark little back room, one snapshot of a boy inscribed to sis. She's a very lonely girl. Mm, how simple it would be to deal with this if it were just malicious gossip. Mm. It would be more wonderful if the whole story were true and Linda and the Professor Hunter ran away and got married and lived happily ever after. <laughs> Let a good English professor get away from Ivy. <laughs> oh, that's a dreadful thought. Uh, Vicky, I think I'll take a short walk. Uh, wear your hat, darling. Don't forget you just had your hair cut. Be back in a minute. <laughs> Dr. Hall. Oh, yes? I was just coming to see you. I'm Linda Matthews. Oh, hello, Linda. I don't want to bother you. Bother me? I've just been talking to myself, and it's much more pleasant to talk to someone else. Come along with me. I suppose you know that Mrs. Hall came to see me this afternoon. Uh, yes, I do. She was so nice to me, and I didn't know what to say. I went all to pieces. Uh, look, Linda, let's turn here and walk around the block. You know, I found that sometimes the best way to straighten things out is to walk in a circle and wind up where you started. <laughs> oh, Dr. Hall, huh? I've made such a mess of everything. I didn't know I was doing know what I'd done. Not until Mrs. Hall told me what everybody was talking about. I don't know why I didn't realize that they would talk about it. Because I started it. I made up a silly story about Professor Huntley and me. I was just showing off. Nobody had anything to do with it except me. But that's all there is to it. I, I lied. Linda, I know it wasn't easy for you to come and tell me this, but I'm afraid it's going to be much, much harder to repeat your story to the man who must hear it. Professor Huntley? Oh, I can't face him, Dr. Hall. I just die. So with the gossip. Uh, I, I didn't mean Professor Huntley. Oh, it's much worse than that. Now, now listen carefully. I'll try to describe Mr. Wellman so that you'll be well fortified for the ordeal. <clears throat> now, Mr. Wellman is a very important man, especially in his own estimation. But he does throw his weight on <laughs> Thank you. 
And it's completely my fault, Mr. Wellman. I made up the whole story. Nobody else had anything to do with it. Uh, uh, Miss Matthews, you admit that you made up this story. How am I to know that you haven't made up another one for my benefit? After all, it wouldn't be the first time someone has made a grand gesture of sacrifice to cover for somebody else. You mean Professor Huntley, Mr. Wellman? He has nothing to do with this at all. You really mean to tell me that you invented this whole thing out of your own head? Oh, let's say out of her own heart, Mr. Wellman. It's a lonely one. Uh, but why? Can you tell me that? Why, Miss Matthews? Oh, I don't believe it's necessary for Miss Matthews to answer that, Mr. Wellman. Any more than it would be for you if I should ask you why you had that dream last night. I didn't have a dream last night, Dr. Hall. <laughs> I never dream. <laughs> now, don't you wish you could? <laughs> I fail to see what dreams have to do with this matter. A great deal, I believe. But Miss Matthews has fully confessed her responsibility. I, I think that's all that has to be considered. Hmm. Well, uh, Dr. Hall, uh, I shall expect you to take proper action. And, lady, I cannot condone what you have done, but I must admire your courage in admitting it. Good day, Dr. Hall. Good day. Goodbye, Mrs. Hall. I shall find my way out. <laughs> I think Mr. Wellman felt cheated. He had his fines got all loaded and waiting for sunrise. <laughs> Linda, you were splendid. I don't know how you managed it. I don't know either, Mrs. Hall. I'm starting to shake now. Well, that's only natural, Linda. Somehow we gain courage in a crisis and then often collapse the moment it's over. But that's the trouble. It's not all over. How can I ever face Professor Huntley? It's sometimes harder to face friends than strangers, Linda. After all, you want to see your friends again. So talk to Professor Huntley, and if he should offer you a lift, there's no need to refuse. And if he wishes to loan you a book, by all means, you... Good heavens. Charlie, what's the matter? It was Professor Huntley, his book on Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. The memo must have slipped out of it. What memo? Five on Prince D and the third. <laughs> I was to give his class a five-minute talk on Hamlet with particular reference to the third act. <laughs> in the third. Oh, dear, how disillusioning. When there's beer on your mind, your best thought is Schlitz, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. More people like the taste of Schlitz than any other beer. That's why Schlitz is the largest selling beer in America. Now here again are Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Uh, good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> Same time at the Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. The other players were Herbert Butterfield, Gail Gordon, Barbara Whiting, Gloria McMillan, Earl Ross, and Charles Davis. Tonight's script was written by Milton and Barbara Merlin and Don Quinn. Music was composed and conducted by Henry Russell. The Halls of Ivy was created by Don Quinn, directed by Nat Wolf, and presented by the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Ken Carpenter speaking.